early during the Marcos uh, administration. Mrs. Uh, Marcos uh, had been interested in the uh, restoration of uh, Intramuros. Uh, she uh, uh, led uh, the restoration of uh, some of the gates of uh, Intramuros. Mrs. Marcos got uh, the engineering divisions of uh, the different uh, services of the uh, military. And, uh, there were lots of objections. I called the attention of President Marcos. So he asked me to draft uh, uh, a charter for Intramuros, which is what I did, and that is the Intramuros Administration uh, Charter. satisfaction I had was uh, the presence of a good team uh, headed by uh, Mrs. Esperanza Catmonton and uh, in the early days uh, also Felix uh, Imperial uh, because uh, basically the three of us uh, were the ones who set the initial uh, directions of uh, the Intramuros administration. important because it's part of our history, part of our heritage, one of the few physical evidences uh, remaining of uh, the uh, Spanish period of Philippine history. I think uh, the major development uh, since uh, that time uh, was the proliferation of informal settlers. And uh, it seems to me that uh, the uh, proper uh, and humanitarian relocation of those informal settlers is uh, critical to the uh, future progress of the country. I'm uh, Jaime Laya. And uh, I think the, uh, the directions of uh, uh, the development of Intramuros uh, embodied in the administration uh, charter continue to be relevant. Well, Intramuros for me uh, is many things because uh, my father used to work in the port area, in Binifacio Drive in port area. So even as a small boy, uh, I really knew Intramuros already back in the 50s. And I was very happy to have been appointed administrator in 1989. And uh, that really uh, involved me more uh, with the history of Intramuros and the uh, plans uh, for its further development. It would be very uh, important that uh, we know where we came from and uh, I think that's the uh, special value of Intramuros. But even in modern times, uh, there could be or there should be, and uh, as it's happening now, uh, other developments here in Intramuros. I'm Jose Capistrano Jr., uh, formerly administrator of Intramuros. Well, uh, as what's happening now, uh, Escuela Letelier assists in the restoration of heritage structures uh, through our training of uh, out-of-school youth in the various arts and crafts of uh, heritage uh, restoration. And uh, I think this is uh, important uh, to preserve our historical and heritage structures. Uh, and at the same time also, reach out to other parts of the country uh, for the same purpose. IA's dedication in ensuring that tangible treasures that immortalize our history are now accessible to the public is commendable. Congratulations to the Intramuros administration. I wasn't expecting that the collection can be so amazing. I was really, it was really an awesome experience seeing all of this collection 
and it's like 30% only of the collection. I wish to see more. Again, congratulations. Sabi ko eh, ito yung malaking isang tagumpay kasi matagal namin naka, nakatabi yan, nakatago at hindi na i-display talaga sa public yan. Pangalawa, nagpalipat-lipat na ng location yan at ngayon, na-save natin. Ito more sa mahalaga para sa akin bilang Pilipino kasi maraming bagay sa Pilipinas dito nagsimula sa Well, actually, more than reviving the structure, talaga may tindihan ng tao kung anong kondisyon ng intramuros sa pagmuro ng Pilipinas. Kasi kung walang pagkilala, walang pagmahal, hindi siya mananatili. Fernando Shazit ako, uh, Professor Emeritus sa Atene de Manila sa Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Ang mensahe ko lang, dapat mas mas nuanced, mas complex ang ating pag-create sa kasaysayan. Kasi mahirap itong black and white eh. Uh, ang pagtingin sa kasaysayan. Masyado moralistic, basta kastila masama. Dapat, dapat mas, ano, mas three-dimensional ang pagtingin sa kasaysayan. Sa akin, special yung Ramuros uh, dahil sa punong-puno ng istorya, historical yung Ramuros. Uh, napamahal na rin po ako dito sa Ramuros dahil dito po ako nagtatrabaho. Ako po si Christian Roa. Ako ay isang security guard ng Ramuros bilang isang uh, katipunera po. Uh, Itutulong ko po dito sa Ramuros na Mapanatili po yung mga kalinisan, kayusan, at matiwasay na pagpapatupad. Next week ko po dito sa Intramuros dahil po sa lalong tumatagal, gumaganda siya at dumarami yung mga turista na pumipisita dito. For me, Intramuros would be actually the soul of a Manilenio, maybe even the soul of uh, the Philippines, because uh, this is really where Manila and how the entire country uh, was known. There is that special place in history for Intramuros. And so I believe it is uh, our soul. I think Intramuros is important because uh, if you do not know where history started, if you do not know where uh, memories uh, came from, then you will be lost. And so I urge everyone to even read a few chapters of books written on Intramuros so they will just know how life then was and how it evolved to life now. We have here close to 400 if not 500 year old uh, history and so uh, there's nothing like going back in time and so Reminisce for me is the word that would describe uh, how I would feel. I'm Roberto P. Laurel, President of the Lyceum of the Philippines University, Manila, Cavite, and Makati campuses. The original LPU uh, was located here in Intramuros, 
in 1952 by my grandfather Jose P. Laurel. Lyceum, LPU has been uh, here for the past 67 years and I believe it has uh, contributed to nation building. We have a number of uh, alumni who we are very proud of, who have accomplished uh, ac great accomplishments, achievements in their private and public uh, lives. I wish Intramuros would uh, develop more, uh, that we have more locators coming in. I know there are a lot of challenges, but I want to commend the Intramuros administration headed by the current administrator, Attorney Asido, for such a uh, focused uh, development uh, effort. It will take time, but progress is there and we can see it moving. And so my hope is that uh, this will continue and that we will become a thriving community, not just uh, alive during the day when we have so many uh, people coming in, but even at night. I'm uh, Martin Tino Jr. My Lolo became chairman of the Comelec, and he was the one who transferred the Comelec to Intramuros. I was in grade school. He would go home at 6 o'clock every afternoon. They pick us up at 4 o'clock, so I have to wait for him in his office. So I would go around Intramuros in the 19, early 50s. It was all ruins. I've always been interested in old houses. I began traveling throughout the whole country. Intramuros was the biggest European city in Asia. This is our history. It defines our culture. The problem is most of our officials do not appreciate it. IA was founded. And uh, Jimmy Laya, I didn't know Jimmy Laya. He got me as a consultant. Then we started having exhibits. Uh, the first ever on relieves, on santos, on ivory. We have all these horrible looking modern buildings. I wish they could tear it down and rebuild it properly. And in the early days, it was really a dead town. Even when Casa Manila was finished, we would make whatever pakulo just to bring in people. In the afternoon, Intramuros was empty. Empty. There was hardly any people. Since last year, I'm really amazed at how Intramuros has grown and has attracted so many people considering the problems we had in the beginning. There are thousands of people coming here and all of them are paying. The entrance fees, restaurants, everything, all those talents. Can you imagine? It's alive. You can see the whole thing is alive. Ang mga binibenta ko po pagkain na ulam, adobo, sinigang, kaldereta, pork chop, fried chicken, eh, may mga gulay, pakbe, tsaka chop soy.
Karamihan na kumakain sa akin, nagtatrabaho sa Mapua, mga empleyado. Tapos, estudyante rin ng Mapua, eh si yung Manila High. Ayun po, nakakatulong ang tindahan po namin sa Intramuros, lalo na po ang Sanamay. Malaking bagay po sa mga estudyante at mga empleyado sa Intramuros na nagtatrabaho. Kasi uh, pangmasa po ang presyo. 40 years na po ako nakatira sa Intramuros. Naranasan na namin yung hirap, baha. <laughs> Para sa amin, ang Intramuros, malaking bagay kasi dito nabuhay yung mga anak ko. Dito ako nagpalaki ng mga anak ko. Dito, dito ko kinuha yung pampalaki ng mga anak ko. Maaral. Kaya ang Intramuros, malaking bagay sa amin. Dito na rin nag-aaral ang mga anak ko ng high school, elementary sa Quiapo, Mabini, sa high school sa Manila High School, sa Intramuros. Ako, ako po si Edna Apable. Merong isang karindirya sa Intramuros. Ang ginagawa ko po, namamalik isang kaling araw. Nagluluto, nagtitinda. Ang pangarap ko po sa Entramuro, sana huwag kami mawala at habang buhay kami makapaghanap buhay sa Entramuro. For me, Entramuro is a place of history. Um, it is a cultural and creative hub and um, it brings so much pride and joy to the 5th District as well. If I could describe Intramuras in one word, it's mesmerizing because walking along or walking around it gives you a sense of history and makes you step into a whole new world that is so different from what you see outside the walls of Intramuros. My fondest memories of Intramuros, I would say, was when I was a little girl because I also grew up here in the 5th District and as a little girl, I would come to Intramuros with my parents, I would tag along, I would ride the Kalesa, I would go around in Tremuros, Fort Santiago, and I would remember also coming to Barbaras to eat with my dad. Hi, my name is Crystal Bagat Singh. I am currently the Congresswoman of the 5th District of Manila, where Intramuros is located. One of my advocacies is um, about culture, preserving culture, and uh, one of the things that I also do as a congresswoman is make legislation and I also have a constituency inside Intramuros. I think it's very important because when you say Metro Manila, there is really no place to go to for a cultural experience or for a historical experience. And there's really no other place like Intramuros. It's, it's, a, it's an original. There's nothing like it. If you want to have a feel of how it was to live during the Spanish times, this is where you go. I wish that everybody would work together to keep Intramuros the way it is, but make it better, preserve it better. Intramuros is very important to us because of the lessons in heritage and history. 
Siguro, in one line no, ng objective ng Bahay Chinoy, establish our rightful place in the Philippine sun. Nag, uh, bukas ito sa public noong 1999, no? uh, ni, inilalarawan nito ang bahagi at ang impact ng mga Chinese Filipinos in all aspects of Philippine life. I wish that the Bahay Chinoy can be recognized in the whole Intramuros and the whole Philippine society. I wish all the visitors, the audience, regardless of race, regardless of origin, regardless of your religion, can be recognized as part of this nation and as part of this uh, nation building and the history of the Philippines. Ako po si Teresita Angsi, founding president ng Kaisa Para sa Kaunlaran, at ngayon ay executive trustee ng Kaisa Heritage Foundation na nagmamanage sa Bahay Chinoy Museum of the Chinese in Philippine Life. Ang ano ko po sa Intramuros is ang ano, isang kasaysayang lugar. Kasi dito, dito nagkaroon ng ano, tigman. Hindi nyo natutunan ko sa eskwelahan. Uh, sa akin siya, nang laki po nang naitulong ng eskwela talaga kasi nung Nung, ano, nung una po na hindi pa ako nakapasok dito, high school graduate lang ako, nahihirapan ako maghanap ng trabaho. So nung nakita ko na mag-opening sila na ano, kailangan nila na ng trainees, so pumasok ako yun. Tapos pagka-graduate ko, binigyan nila ako ng opportunity na magtrabaho sa mga heritage site. Uh, ako po si Christian Edward Aguirre. Bali, ano po, instructor po ako ngayon ng ano, Masonry Workshop dito sa Eskwela Talia. Ang laki ng ano, tulong, unang-una doon sa paninirahan. Uh, nagkaroon, mayroon kami matitirahan sa loob. Dito ako nakatira. Sana po mas tumibay pa ang komunidad dito sa Dota.
Right, so we shall start now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Rancho Arcelia, your host, and this episode is brought to you by the Intramuros Administration. Now, this is a very special episode. So this is the 49th episode of the Intramuros Learning Sessions. So this is special because today we are also celebrating the 410th anniversary of the Pontifical and Royal University of Santo Tomas in Manila. Now, our webinar for today We'll talk about the timeless, leg leg timeless legacies of the University of Santo Tomas. But before we start, I'd like to read first some house rules. So uh, if you are viewing via Zoom, you may raise your questions via the Q&A button below or in the chat button below. And if you are viewing via Facebook Live, you can also raise your questions in the comment section below. Only those who have successfully registered and given Zoom will be eligible to get a certificate and a feedback form will be emailed to you after the session. The certificate will then be sent within a week. Note that, note that this webinar is recorded. And shall be made permanently available in IA social media channels. Right. So for the speaker of today, I give you Dr. Eloisa de Castro. So Maria Eloisa G. Parco de Castro, PhD, is an associate professor of history at the University of Santo Tomas, where she earned her BA, MA, as well as doctorate degrees. She was a contributing author to La Naval, Triumph of People's Faith, which was awarded as the best was the best book in history in 2008 by the National Book Development Authority. Dr. De Castro edited A History of the University of Santo Tomas for Centuries of Higher Education, which was chosen as best book in social sciences during the Ginto Akat Awards in 2014. She also edited the second edition of national artist Carlos Quirino's Old Manila. Uh, and in 2019, Dr. De Castro was given a research award, award by the National Commission for Culture and the Arts for her study on Philippine secondary education in the Philippines in the Spanish colonial period, which is being prepared for publication. All right, so without further ado, I now give you Dr. Loisa de Castro. Pam. Mom, your audio, mom. Now, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Ah, okay, very good. So, good afternoon to everybody. I'm happy to see you all uh, today. And as you can see, um, we can probably start sharing the slides, Rancho. Okay, thank you very much. So, as you can see, the title of my presentation is In Truth and Virtues, Timeless Legacies of the University of Santo Tomas from 1611 to 1941. As you all know, today is the 410th anniversary of the signing of the Foundation Act of the University of Santo Tomas. And I was requested uh, to talk about uh, uh, her legacy or legacies and uh, especially uh, the, the, the portion of, of USC's history in uh, Intramuros. So that would be roughly from 1611 to 1941, which would be a total of 330 years. But I, don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but give you highlights of the history. So some of them would be known to you, others would be not so known to you, but all of them would, I hope, be definitely um, enlighten you towards the timeless legacies of the University of Santo Tomas. Next slide, please. So we'll begin with uh, the founder, no? the so-called founder of the University of Santo Tomas, the first Archbishop of Neva Segovia, Father Miguel de Benavides OP, and the third nominated Archbishop of Manila. He is recognized as the first inventor and author of uh, the whole idea of founding a colegio 
which eventually became the University of Santo Tomas. Next slide, please. This is a painting that shows um, Archbishop Benavides seated and um, uh, writing his last will on July 4, 1605, which is about two days before he, he passed away. You can see two other Dominicans present, and these are actually Domingo de Nieva, Father Domingo de Nieva, who was the prior of Santo Domingo at that time, and Father Bernardo de Santa Catalina, who was the commissary of the Holy Office, who were the executors of his last will. Two days after, he passed away. And as you all know, uh, as many Stomatians would know, uh, he left his personal library to the, to the future University of Santo Tomas and all his worldly uh, goods, which amounted to something like 1,000 pesos. Now, this is the last page of the Foundation Act, whose anniversary we are celebrating now, so uh, today. So you can see uh, the mention of Father Baltasar Fort, the prior provincial of uh, the Dominicans. And you have Father Francisco Minayo, uh, who is the prior of Santo Domingo, and Father Bernardo de Santa Catalina, who, was the, who is the only surviving uh, executor because Father Domingo de Nieva also passed away. And then below you can see the flourishes, the signatures, which uh, effectively um, uh, bequeaths to the future Colegio de Santo Tomas, the 1,000 pesos plus the personal library, which become, will become part of what we call today as the UST library. Next slide, please. So here we can see uh, the uh, on the lower uh, left-hand portion in the square uh, box on the left, the name uh, would be uh, Juliana Gutierrez, who is the first a woman who was the first to uh, sell her lot to the Dominicans. So that's that's the beginning of the the series of uh, properties which will eventually form the entire block which will become the University of Santo Tomas. These lots were not acquired in one year, but acquired over a long period of time. So you have another lot uh, below that to the south by uh, Gaspar. Uh, <clears throat> and you have um, this lot. These two lots were the first to be acquired, and then all the others around it would uh, eventually be acquired so that by 1690, this illustration is given to us by Father Peguero, the historian at that time of the Dominicans, 1690. He drew this, this is his uh, illustration, which shows how the university eventually came to acquire all the other lots around it, which is today occupied by the, ba the BF condominiums. Uh, this is that uh, the original location of Santo Tomas. Next uh, slide, please. So the USD legacy, I divided it into two. The first would be uh, the material or tangible heritage. And so most of this, I think, would be known to Thomasians. I will explain each one briefly. And uh, there is also the second portion, which would be about the intangible heritage. Next slide, please. So we have, uh, this is a photograph of a sampling of the collection of the Antonio Vivencio del Rosario Heritage uh, Section of the UST Miguel de Benavides Library. The library, as you can see, started in 1605. And some of these tomes that you can see in the photograph were donated also by many different people. Um, and through the years, they began to form uh, the very huge collection, which is now uh, the UST Library. Next slide, please. So these are some of those who have donated uh, to the USD library, of course, beginning with Father Miguel de Benavides, followed by another Dominican bishop, uh, Diego de Soria, who also donated his personal library after he passed away, and one of the well-known uh, officials of the Spanish colonial government, uh, Hernando de los Rios Coronel, whose uh, collection was also donated. And then we have, of course, uh, the collection or the library from uh, the Colegio de San Ignacio, which passed on to the 
UST uh, library in 1785, not in 1768, although the Jesuit expulsion occurred in 1768, but it took the Spanish colonial government several years to decide where the library would be going. And so by 1785, through a royal decree, it was decided that it would go to Santo Tomas. No? Now, in the 20th century, President Jostado Macapagal, the, his library was donated to UST together with, uh, after a few years, of course, uh, you have National Artist Nick Joaquin's uh, personal library, now called Rincon de Nick Joaquin Corner, Nick Joaquin's Corner in uh, the UST library, plus the heirs of Fernando Canon, who had donated uh, the personal copy of their great-grandfather, the first edition of the Noli and the Fili. Next slide, please. So one of the most uh, important books in the USC library is this famous um, and very rare uh, book, the 1543 De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium of Nicolas Copernicus. Uh, in 2011, when uh, USD celebrated its 400th year, the library made an inventory and did research and found out that there were only five copies of this book in the whole world. There are only two in Asia and one of them is in USD. So this is the sixth book of that very uh, famous uh, book um, of Nicolas Copernicus. Part of the reason why it is rare is because it has been banned by the church at that time. No, So we are so fortunate to have a copy in USD. Then another rare uh, part of the collection of the library would be Libertas, which is a daily newspaper, believe it or not, a daily newspaper published by the Dominican Fathers beginning in 1899 until 1918 when it was suppressed, yes, suppressed by the United States government. So it is the only, possibly the only daily newspaper that has been published by a university in the Philippines. So it was issued, uh, as, as pointed out, every day it would be, uh, it would come out. And there is, of course, uh, a certain number of subscribers until it was suppressed because it was perceived to be anti, it was perceived to be anti-American, but actually it was not. Uh. Next slide, please. And uh, I think uh, I, I will not go into the details of the library collection because I think uh, that's uh, it, it, it's too big to be discussed now. But I will look. I would like you to take a look at what Father Horacio de la Costa, a famous uh, Jesuit uh, historian and the first Filipino provincial of the Philippine Society of Jesus, said about our library. We need hardly mention. The well-known fact that the Venerable University of Santo Tomas has perhaps the richest collection anywhere in this country of materials pertaining to the Spanish period of our history. Next slide, please. Now we come to uh, the facade. Actually, this is the old building. This is the original building of uh, UST in Intramuros, uh, which was constructed between 1609 to 1620. So the first two dents were accepted in 1619. And uh, this photograph is taken around 1912 so that uh, you can see, I'd like you to pay attention to the entrance because you will see this in the succeeding uh, slides. So Rizal himself, as well as all, the, all those who had studied in uh, Santo Tomas uh, in Intramuros had gone through the same portals. And of course, as you all know, uh, El Filibusterismo, practically almost one third, I think, of the story in El Filibusterismo takes place around this area of the university, which tells you how much Rizal remembers about his own student life in the University of Santo Tomas. Next slide, please. So this photograph, shows the same entrance, but this time you see that they have done some renovations in celebration of 
an event in 19, the 1920s which added uh, the architectural features. You see that uh, they decided to change the facade of the building and the entrance, which and they added the balconies above, which changed uh, slightly the appearance of uh, this side. But you see that the stone uh, entry remains the same. I also would like you to uh, to uh, to draw your attention to the marker, which is on the lower left-hand portion of the entrance. And this is the marker dedicated to Dr. Jose Rizal, which of course, who of course is one of the best known graduates of Santo Tomas. Next slide, please. Now you see this is what is left of the building after uh, the Japanese uh, firebombed the entire building on February 8, 1945. Uh, it was not totally destroyed in 1941 when the Japanese bombed Intramuros. Uh, there were still some uh, portions of the building were still standing, but what was left of it was destroyed by the Japanese during the battle for Manila. So this is the only one which uh, was left. And as you all know, the stones of this um, facade, especially the entrance, would be taken one by one and brought to the new uh, campus in Sulucan, in Sampaloc. And now we call this, next slide please, as the Arch of the Centuries. So you have, they added the top portion to it put the figure of Tom, St. Thomas Aquinas, of course, after whom the university is named. And you, they have added also through the years another marker, this time uh, dedicated to uh, the first president of the Commonwealth, uh, Manuel Quezon, who is also a Thomasian. This, of course, is uh, the uh, Arch of the Centuries was declared a national cultural treasure. I'm not the not the arch, but uh, the spaces would be dis dis declared as national cultural treasures. But this uh, Arch of the Centuries, together with the main building and the father's residence and the USC seminary, would be considered as national historical landmarks of the Philippines. Okay, next slide, please. So we have the archives of the University of Santo Tomas founded uh, on the same um, year as the university. It is a very rich collection. I would not have time to discuss all of them, but I only chose specific uh, uh, items for your uh, for discussion today. As you all know, documents pertaining to the university would all be stored here, but there are other documents that are part of that collection. This is the Baybayin collection, which is considered one of the largest uh, uh, collections of Baybayin, um, allegedly, you know, as reported by a scholar from Canada, one of the lar considered the largest collection of Baybayin in the world, which had been declared as also as national cultural treasures a few years ago. We also had the APSR microfilms, APSR meaning uh, Archivo de la Provincia de Santísimo Rosario, which is the archives of the Spanish province of the Dominicans, which all the originals are in Avila, Spain. So scholars do not need to go to Avila, but may use the microfilms in the Archivo, in the, in the archives. I found this very uh, interesting. There is a collection of manuscripts called Edictos from 1690 to 1808 which were issued by the Mexican Tribunal for the Holy Office or the Holy Office of the Inquisition. And according to Father Villaruel, this is perhaps, this collection is perhaps the only official documentation that survived the British occupation from 1762 to 64. Um, so um, this remains to be studied um, and of course will, will be valuable in trying to um, put together some kind of a history of the commissary of the Holy Office in the Philippines. Then you would have the miscellanea or the miscellaneous collection, which uh, is um, a never ending um, source of surprises. Next slide, please. We have the Libro de Piques, which is dated 1636. This is a very important book for all Famasians, at least until the end of the Spanish colonial period, because the, no one, uh, the graduates of the licensed degrees, the masters and the doctorate, uh, would have to 
uh, use this in order to be assigned the topics that they would have to defend for the oral examination as a requirement for graduation. I would like to point out that the Libro de Piques is completely from the first uh, page all the way up to the end. This is completely handwritten. So everything here, including what you think is printed de la Universidad de Santo Tomas, this is all handwritten. Uh, so very beautiful. And this is considered to be, what you see here is considered as the first official seal of the University of Santo Tomas, which dates from 16. 36. Next slide, please. So the unending series of surprises uh, would include uh, the discovery of uh, a book of hours. This is like a prayer book uh, where you would have a designated um, prayer for every, every hour on the hour. It's a small book. But every page is illumined in gold, uh, in gold paint and uh, illustrated. And it seems that uh, the history of these types of books would be uh, that they are owned mostly by, by people, by, high, by the high-born, by royalty, by, by queens, by kings, by princes. And so we do not know how this book ended up in the archives, but an article came out of this, which was uh, collaborated by Dr. John Crossley and the archivist uh, Regalado Trota Jose published in Filipina na Sacra. And then another interesting um, part of the archives would be the Diccionario Español Chino, which was found, uh, which was, which is there, but where, which was um, studied by Taiwanese, uh, Chinese uh, scholars. And uh, in 2017, which excited them no end, I, that was the report of um, Professor Jose, because they, they thought that this is the oldest dictionary, Spanish-Chinese dictionary uh, ever, uh, ever found ex extant, no? as pointed out. So the Academia Sinica of Taiwan has issued um, a uh, reprinted version of this. Next slide, please. This is a uh, page from uh, the said Dictionario, which has been, uh, which which is, of course, completely transcribed and then uh, reprinted um, uh, by the Academia Sinica. Next slide, please. Okay, this is another Diccionario, which is, uh, this time it is uh, Spanish, Japanese, and this dates from around 1630, during the time when the Dominicans were very actively evangelizing in Japan. So this is another very important dictionary which uh, probably is awaiting uh, study or investigation by, uh, by scholars. Next slide, please. This is uh, the first page of the Libro Nuevo, which would be the list of the colegiales or the internos, the people, the students who are living in uh, inside uh, Santo Tomas, no? starting from 1759, as you can see, Mayo de 1659, no? May of 1759, all the way up to 1885. This is important because uh, the names of the first natives, the names of the first um, Filipinos, we call ourselves Filipinos now, but at that time, natives, the first the names of the first natives who would become students or internos in Santo Tomas are here. So I, I thought that this would be very interesting for everybody to uh, know. Next slide, please. Now, this one is actually a program, a literary program, Certamen Literario. This is a collect. This is a program which uh, would be put by, put up by, presented by the students of Father Salvador Losent. That's an S, no Losent, uh, the professor of Latin and Spanish at that time. This is 1775. But uh, before 1775, when when uh, Father Losent came to UST from 1770 to 1772. He gathered uh, the samples of his students' poems. No? So again, Father Villaruel tells us that this might be 
this collection might be the first, the earliest extant uh, samples of uh, poems by, by natives, by Filipinos. So they are in Latin and they are also in Spanish. No? And the larger number of the uh, students in the colegio at that time were actually uh, externos. They are not living inside uh, the university but living outside. So externs. So uh, since majority of the externs were natives, then according to Father Villaruel, this would mean that the larger number of the authors would actually be natives. So that's interesting for the literary history of the Philippines. Next slide, please. Now this one is a page which lists down the names of the student militia. I think there's a very popular story that's go, that has gone around saying that uh, UST has put up uh, uh, companies of uh, student militia, the student militia, to uh, fight the British in 1762, but that's not quite accurate. This, this student militia was put up in 1785, I, I'm sorry, 1780, no? because of uh, the war of independence between the United States, what is going to become the United States of America and uh, England, and because Spain sided with the United States and France, uh, Britain, there's a possibility that, that, uh, that England might um, attack the Philippines. So in preparation for that, the university volunteered to put up four companies of student militia composed of students. Some of them became uh, secular members of the secular clergy, became priests. No? So each company had 50 uh, members. So you can imagine around 200 would be maintained by the university for several years until the threat of the British attack would pass. No? So next slide, please. Then we have the UST Press, which uh, uh, you all know that the Dominicans founded the first printing press in the Philippines. And that eventually, that same printing press eventually became the UST Press. However, before it finally settled, in UST, it became a pilgrim press. It moved around from, <coughs> excuse me, from Binondo to Abukay Bataan to Tayabas, which is now Quezon, eventually going to the Franciscans no, in Tayabas, and then uh, to the Augustinians in Pampanga, Betis, Pampanga. And then finally, uh, we see in the records that <coughs> it would be in the University of Santo Tomas, we, we don't know exactly why uh, and how it moved uh, around, but the most likely explanation is because there is an absence of, there is absolutely hardly any printing press in the islands. And so this printing press is really valuable. And so it was borrowed from one uh, religious order to another until it finally settled in UST in 1625 when it printed also its first book. And these names are those that you find in the title pages of many of the books that were printed from the 17th century all the way to the present. No? Tipografia del Colegio de Santo Tomás, Tipografia del Universidad, the UST Press, and today it is still existing under the name UST Publishing House. It is also considered the second oldest continuing press in the world after Cambridge University Press. Next slide, please. This is a replica of the typographic uh, press, which has been, uh, which was sort of, according to uh, the historians, invented, no, invented by Father Blancas de San Jose. And so a replica of this was displayed in 2011, and I think it is now in the UST Museum. Next slide, please. This is the first book printed in UST. So you can see the famous Tomas Pintin uh, was the printer, and this is dated 1625. This um, book is found in the um, National Library of France in Paris. Okay, next slide, please. Now, another important uh, material 
uh, our tangible heritage of the University of Santo Tomas is, of course, the UST Museum of Arts and Sciences, founded around 60, 1865 when the royal order for the establishment of the public secondary school system was uh, issued by uh, the Spanish colonial government. So one of the requirements was the establishment of a museum of natural history, which is its original name. Uh, the collections were expanded through specimens from different uh, Dominican missions, from Vietnam, from Japan, from Taiwan, and from other parts. And it is considered today as the oldest existing university museum in the Philippines, even antedating the National Museum of the Philippines. Uh, this is uh, a photograph of the old collection in Intramuros before it was moved uh, around 1935, providentially saving it from destruction because uh, in 1935, there was already a new building in the Sampalo campus or what is called the Sulukan campus, which today we call the UST main building. So the director at that time, I believe it's Father Silvestre Sancho, ordered the transfer of the UST Museum, uh, which of course saved it, not just the museum, the library, the archives, all of these were transferred to the main building. So when Intramuros was bombed by the Japanese in 1941, practically almost all the libraries were lost except the UST uh, library and the archives. So this is why uh, the transfer was providential. Next slide, please. Now we have the 1891 Benavides statue, which is found today in front of the USD main building in San Palo. But originally, this is in Plaza Santo Tomas, which uh, separates the Colegio de Santa Rosa from uh, the University of Santo Tomas. No? Now, the project was, or it was conceived by the rector at that time, Father Joaquin Fonseca, in 1878. But uh, it was um, suspended because he had to return uh, to Spain. Uh, and it was not the, the fundraising. It was originally thought to, to be uh, to, to cost about 30,000 pesos, which is a very huge amount of money. So the students were, um, were requested to uh, donate. No, there is a fund uh, raising activity, uh, which, which according to Father Villaruel was not very popular, and the, it only raised around four thousand pesos. But he says that since this is the same time that Rizal was a student in Santo Tomas, it may also be possible that Rizal may have contributed to uh, the fundraising. Now, the. Uh, uh, project was revived in uh, 1888 by another U.S. director, Father Gregorio Echevarria. Um, so finally, it was cast in Paris. It's made of bronze and made by the company Tony Noel. It cost a total of 9,750 pesos and arrived in Manila in 1891 to be installed in time for the opening of that same uh, year, you know, that school, the school year of that same year, 1891. It is one of the few surviving uh, um, representations of the original Santo Tomas. In um, survived, it survived the Battle of Battle for Manila, and of course, brought to the USD campus and installed and blessed with a great ceremony. You can see some of the photographs and the program. And then it was uh, blessed in 30 November, 1946. So this is the original location. You can see um, the Gothic uh, Santo Domingo, and which is now occupied supposedly by the BPI. And this is uh, the Colegio de Santa Rosa. The statue faces uh, the building, the original building of Santo Tomas. Next slide, please. Now we come to the non-material or the intangible heritage. I got these definitions in order to help us along because uh, some people may not uh, fully understand what intangible heritage is. Heritage may be uh, defined uh, or described as something passed down through the generations, through generations, 
but intangible actually refers to all those things that you cannot touch, all mater immaterial elements considered by a given community as intrinsic to its identity, as well as its uniqueness and distinct distinctiveness in comparison with other human groups. Now, knowing this, we can proceed to the next slide, which would be the first, some examples of this intangible heritage would be social practices, ritual ceremonies, festive events, uh, performing arts, songs, folklore, values, traditions, identities, and of course, historical memory. I highlighted in gold, that's a deliberate choice, uh, in gold, uh, ceremony, songs, values, and historical memory, because these are the things which I will be uh, describing. Next slide, please. So for ceremony, uh, every student um, who would be who would who would be um, aspiring to graduate needs to go through what is called the noche triste or the sad night or the frightful night, as it is sometimes translated. And this would mean an oral examination, especially for the licentiates and the doctorates. You would have these two silver jars, which will be um, the containers for the wooden uh, chips, no? round chips. You can see three of them and two more on the right, three on the left, two on the right. And these um, tiles or wooden chips would have letters, letter A for aprobado, letter S for sobresaliente, excellent, and letter R for reprobado, which means failed. No, So this... Uh, uh, chips will be put into the jars and eventually counted to find out whether a student has passed or a student has failed. And then you see the hourglass. Of course, this hourglass is the time limit that a student would have in answering or explaining the topics given to him. Uh, the silver tray on the right contains the in writing instruments used by the members of the panel. Today, Parts of this ceremony live on. They are still with us. Um, I remember all the master's uh, degree candidates uh, who would be defending would have this box. It's not a jar anymore. It's a wooden box. And now instead of the wooden tiles, they are given uh, balls. Every panelist would put uh, a certain number of balls, which would be counted. And then uh, later on... Um, equated or, or determined whether uh, you have enough uh, to be able to uh, graduate and pass and acquire your your degree. No? So to a certain extent, this lives on in, in, the, in the every time that there is a defense, an oral examination in the graduate school. Uh, this is, uh, uh, this, that's a uh, um, part of the original portions of the, this uh, practices would come from the original ceremonies which were observed during the Spanish colonial period. Next one, please. This is a silver bell. You can see the year, um, 1684. This is rung um, to signal the beginning of the oral examination. And then uh, there is a break after, I think, about two hours, there's a break. And uh, to signal the resumption or the continuation of the oral examination, the bell again is rung. No? And we still do this because uh, there is a bell that is rung in order to, after the deliberation, during an oral examination, the candidate, or after the, the, the actual uh, uh, defense, the candidate is asked, asked to step out of the room so that the panel could deliberate uh, and put the balls in the box. No? And when they are finished, a bell is rung, which is a continuation, no? It's a continuation of the original practice, which has been done since the 17th century. Next slide, please. Now, this is quite interesting, no? This is the so-called Paseo de los Doctores, or the cavalcade of doctors. This is actually an illustration that is found in a 1929 history book in Spanish, of the history of the University of Santo Tomas. But as pointed out by Rancho earlier, um, the people are dressed um, in the style of the 17th century. You can see them. And uh, this cavalcade of doctors would uh, mean that 
this is led by the by the rector who's uh, who, who is astride the horse riding the horse the faculty would also be riding horses no i was saying that i'm glad that we don't have to do that anymore because i don't think i can ride a horse today but this is the way that a candidate would be brought to um santo domingo or brought to uh <clears throat> santo tomas no so he would be escorted by uh faculty members and the entire procession would go around intramuros announcing that he is a candidate for a licensed candidate for a doctorate degree and this will be repeated uh, the next day uh, if the candidate has successfully defended uh, uh, the points that he is required to do and uh, this would this would go to uh, um, Santo Domingo, where the actual graduation takes place. Now, you see, this practice was suspended around 1745, around that time, because it was considered too expensive and very, it, it, it had um, inconvenienced so many others. I remember one comment in the of one of the candidates, not only was it expensive, but it was considered so inconvenient to go through the streets of Intramuros uh, in at a particular season when uh, it, it is so muddy. So this must be the rainy season, no? It is so muddy. And so therefore, because of that, um, the administration of Santo Tomas decided to suspend uh, the Paseo de los Doctores and from then on, it was not done uh, on foot or there were no, uh, nobody, there's no one, not even uh, the faculty members would ride the horses anymore, but they would ride um, carriages, no, carriages so that there is, there is, it's faster and then it would be less uh, uh, inconvenient for the participants, no, but this is, we can still see, um, vestiges of this during the graduation when you have all the doctors all the faculty going marching no marching into uh, uh, the graduation uh, um, venue no so parts of this are still alive no and continued today next we have songs okay i just chose three but there are more uh, definitely the Salve Regina is still very much sung today, not just in the chapel, but also in the seminary, in uh, certain uh, occasions. I remember uh, the late uh, Father Frederick Fermin's birthdays, celebrations. Every time uh, he would celebrate his birthday and he would have a large uh, a large number of people as visitors, we all know that the program or the celebration is ended when everybody is requested to stand up and sing the Salve Regina. Then, of course, the famous Despedida to Nuestra Señora del Rosario de la Naval de Manila. I think, uh, I hope you know that UST became uh, a safe haven for the image of La Naval when uh, Santo Domingo was destroyed in the Second World War, the image was saved providentially again and brought into uh, UST, the UST chapel where it stayed for many years during the war and after until the new Santo Domingo church in Quezon City was finished. After which there was a great uh, procession from UST to Santo Domingo Quezon City which escorted the, the Tomasians escorted Our Lady of the Rosary to her final new, uh, her new home in Quezon City. You know? So the Despedida is very much alive and sung today. And of course, do I need to uh, explain the UST hymn? No, part of the title of my presentation, In Truth and in Virtues, is taken from uh, one of the lines of the UST hymn. Next slide, please. Now we come to the values, uh, also called the virtues of uh, virtues, cardinal virtues by St. Thomas Aquinas. I found several instances in the history of the university where um, uh, Dominicans and lay people had manifested 
extraordinary uh, demonstrations of fortitude, uh, also called sometimes as courage by some people. Uh, I, this refers to endurance to overcome obstacles in daily life and persecution in spiritual life. So in, from 1633 to 1637, there were five Dominicans who were killed in, uh, executed in uh, Japan because of the Tokugawa persecutions of uh, Christians. All of them became martyrs and eventually canonized saints of the church. Um, all of them did not uh, apostatize. All of them stayed true to being Catholics. One of them was the, was the rector of UST, Father Antonio Gonzalez, who was asked to step, no, to step into the image of the Virgin, which he refused to do. And so he was tortured, he was uh, killed, but they all died uh, happy, some of them singing all the way until they died. No? So this is an extraordinary manifestation of fortitude, uh, which would be repeated 80 years after in 1773 by another martyr and also uh, who be, would be canonized saint by Saint John Paul II in uh, Rome, who is Saint Vicente Liem de la Paz. No? another uh, Dominican priest, educated in Latran and UST, and beheaded in Vietnam during the persecutions there. So, now another virtue, another value that would be exhibited by many uh, professors and also students would be prudence, which refers to doing the right thing at the right time. So doing the right thing at the right time. This is one of the most difficult values or virtues uh, to observe. In 1690, Father Juan Peguero, in his history of the order, mentioned that there were already four indigenous students, which means natives, Filipinos, in uh, Santo Tomas. This is, of course, a little bit problematic because of the practice of the purity of blood, or what is called limpieza de sangre. But you see, um, there are always exceptions, no? So you have to have the wisdom to know when to do the right thing at the right time. And definitely the, the, Francis, the, the, the Dominicans, the fathers uh, in Santo Tomas uh, felt that it was time to admit the natives. So this is a great exercise of prudence, which of course would be Shown again in uh, by 1712 to 1714, very very definitely in the in the folder which is called Asientos de Grados, which would detail every degree granted by Santo Tomas. There were already a total of 50 native graduates by that time, so that's important. But nowhere the next the next event, which is very controversial that happened in 1776 was the issue of the granting of the licentiates to two Chinese mestizos uh, who were prevented from uh, acquiring their licentiates by the claustro, the university claustro. Uh, the claustro is made up of alumni, doctors, licentiates uh, of UST. Uh, five of them were Dominican friars who allowed, who would want to give, uh, grant the Chinese mestizos their licentiates. But the six other members were uh, Spanish secular priests who were canons of the Manila Cathedral. They were the ones who refused to grant uh, these Chinese mestizos their licentiates. So they had to go to the, to the audiencia. This is the Supreme Court. They filed the case preventing the Dominicans from giving the licentiates to the Chinese mestizos, again, because of the so-called limpieza, de sangre. But there was a very important uh, um, explanation given by a Dominica. Next slide, please. This is found in the dictamen juridico, which was authored by Father Juan Amador. And I would like to quote portions of it. Quote, nobility is acquired in many ways. For if we consider our origin, we are all equal, according to the divine scriptures. If the University of Santo Tomas were to grant degrees only to Spaniards and their sons, 
it would become within a few years an idle institution because it is publicly well known that the sons of Spaniards who pursue the study of the sciences are so few and their number is incomparably lower than that of Indios and Mestizos put together. End of quote. But I highlighted in gold that the words we are all equal because this will resonate in the coming years. This whole idea of equality will be sustained, will be uh, fought for by uh, the Dominicans and by the Tomasians in different ways. No? So how did the whole uh, issue end? They got their wish, the audiencia. Um, sided with the Chinese mestizos, so they were finally granted their license sheets. But the story also has a very, very nice uh, postscript. Next slide, please. On April 28, 1777, the two Chinese mestizos, Father Francisco Borja and Father Vicente de los Reyes, took their vows to join the Dominican order. So this means, therefore, that today we are celebrating the 244th anniversary of their profession. So isn't that nice? I think that's a nice postscript to the whole controversy. Next slide, please. But nowhere is this whole idea of equality more demons, more uh, uh, um, contentious than the issue of than in the issue of the secularization of parishes. You all know the role played by Father Pedro Pelaez and Father Jose Burgos. Um, in one of his responses to the Archbishop, <clears throat> who somehow reproved him for uh, some of his suggestions, Father Burgos said in one of his letters that uh, I have always believed that we are all equal in God's sight, no? and so on. So you see, this is, this is prudence, doing the right thing at the right time. Um, to Father Burgos, this is the right time, and this is the right thing, which is the reason why Father John Schumacher, another famous uh, um, Jesuit church historian, had said that Pelaez and Burgos were the proto-nationalists. They were the ones who set the stage for the development of what is going to be eventually called the nationalist consciousness. Uh, you all know that uh, Burgos uh, was martyred in 1872 as a consequence of the Cavite mutiny. Um, and I hope you all remember that uh, El Filibusterismo was dedicated by Dr. Jose Rizal to Gomez Burgos and Zamora, just to tell you how deeply Rizal was affected by the whole um, issue of the execution of Gomez Burgos and Zamora. Next slide, please. So the next, uh, the next value uh, that or virtue that we would discuss is justice. Justice, which means uh, what is due between equal. So again, I draw your attention to the term equal. So equality is very important in the exercise of justice. So um, Burgos is, and Pela, Father Burgos and Father Pelais were very much connected to the professors of secondary education. How? because they were inspectors of secondary education. So they came to know many of these professors of secondary education because some of them were actually Father Burgos's contemporaries in Santo Tomas. Amongst them, Hippolito Magsalin, Father Mariano Sevilla, Benedicto de Luna, Quintin Saldivea, and Jose Flores. Father Mariano Sevilla uh, defended his doctorate um, in the same day as Father Burgos uh, defended his doctorate uh, um, in Santo Tomas. Benedicto de Luna had, a, 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 um, had uh, become, actually, if I remember correctly, he was a contemporary of Burgos. They defended their licentiates in philosophy in the same day. So they were batchmates. Quintin Saldivea, for his part, had a unique role. He was examined by Burgos. So Burgos was his panelist, examiner in his 
um, uh, oral examination no, for philosophy. But five years after, Quintin Zaldivea became the examiner of Burgos for Burgos's degree, doctorate degree in uh, sacred theology. So you see, these are contemporaries and personally known to Burgos. So when they became professors of secondary education, do you really think that they forgot about what happened to Father Burgos, Gomez, and Zamora? So I think the whole idea of equality was kept alive and this idea of justice, be, the, giving justice to the martyrs would never be forgotten by these professors of secondary education who uh, would be connected. Father Mariano Sevilla is supposed to be connected to Pashano Rizal because Pashano Rizal was said to have lived in Father Mariano Sevilla's house uh, until 1872. And then we have, um, uh, for example, uh, Marcelo del Pilar, who also, uh, I'm sorry, not Mariano Sevilla, but Father Mariano Sevilla would be connected with, let me correct myself, Father Mariano Sevilla uh, 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 was uh, able to uh, allow Marcelo del Pilar to live in his house until uh, 1872 when the Cavite mutiny broke out. Whereas Pashano Rizal lived with Father Burgos. So you see the connection of Father Burgos to Pashano Rizal, Pashano Rizal to Jose Rizal. So you see, uh, this is the continuity of, uh, of uh, um, you know, the, uh, the continuity, the passing on of, of, uh, of uh, remembrance, no? the, the memory, uh, the value, especially um, I think when they would give examples of uh, examples for justice and equality, naturally, um, the lessons um, obtained from the martyrdom of Gomez, Burgos, and Zamora would would be alive in the memory of this if this men, these people, and would be. Um, would be passed on to the generation of heroes who would be students of many of these this, uh, professors of secondary education um, from 1880 to 1898. And uh, if you come to think about it, if justice is what is due between equals, um, then equality can only be achieved if there is total separation from Spain. And so that would mean independence. And so you would have the Philippine Revolution. And you would have the framers of the 1899 Madolos Constitution definitely having this in mind that, that justice and equality can only be achieved with independence from Spain. And it also happened that 63 of the 91 signatories of the Madolos Constitution were Tomasians. Next, next slide, please. Now, from 1901 to 1941, I'm going uh, towards the end. I'll make it uh, quick. Uh, the Philippine-American War continued from 1899 to 1903. But during that time, it is not only the Americans that the Filipinos fought against. Again, an issue of justice and equality no? and independence. But the Filipino secular clergy also had to um, struggle uh, because of the schismatic uh, movement of the Iglesia Filipina Independiente at that time. So Father Schumacher says, literally, the Filipino secular clergy kept the church alive in the most dire circumstances. So again, you see the role played by many of these Tomasians, such as Father Cosme Abaya, and then you would have Father Mariano Sevilla, Father, um, uh, Father Rojas, uh, who is also a Tomasian. And then by 1907, uh, when uh, the Americans allowed the, the lower house to be uh, convened, the Philippine Assembly, uh, which is, of course, a desire of the Filipinos to become independent of America, they have never lost sight of that independence. 54 out of the 80 members were Tomasians. So you see, again, uh, the role of Santo Tomas there. And around the same year, the first uh, Tomasian bishop, his Excellency Alfredo Versosa of Lipa was uh, elevated to the bishopric. By 1915 to 1916, Tomasians uh, 
began to move out and occupy many different uh, positions, especially outside Santo Tomas. And I'd like to mention two. One is Ignacio Villamor, who became the first Filipino president of the University of the Philippines in 1915. And probably lesser known is Dr. Fernando Calderon, the older brother of Felipe Calderon, who is one of the signers of the Malolos Constitution, a medical doctor and a graduate of UST, became the first dean of the College of Medicine of the University of the Philippines, and was also the first director of the Philippine General Hospital. The little research that I've done showed that these people, especially Dr. Calderon, struggled with uh, racism. This, the American said, it's not very good. He doesn't speak English very well. But he became director, the first Filipino director, and he was able to manage the PGH very well and also get uh, the sympathies and got the, the nurses to cooperate because from the little that I've seen, the Filipino nurses wanted, uh, had, had, uh, did not want to serve under an American medical doctor who did not understand them. But it seems that Dr. Calderon understood them very well. And so he became one of the longest directors of PGH. So... You, you, we continue, we see the continuation of the service to the church um, of Thomasians when the second uh, bishop who is a Thomasian was uh, appointed in 1917. Uh, His Excellency Santiago Sancho of Tugigarao. And then, of course, we come closer to our dream of independence when in 1935 the Commonwealth was inaugurated with President um, Manuel Quezon as its, uh, as its first president and then later on followed by Sergio Osmeña who would be both Tomasians. And then finally in 1941 before Manuel Quezon, the president, uh, uh, was evacuated from Bataan because Bataan is about to surrender. Uh, so the, he and his family were going to be evacuated to Mindanao later on to go to Australia. President Quezon is on record for having taken uh, Jose Laurel aside and giving him the responsibility to take care of the Filipino people. He said, you must stay behind because if no one is left behind, the Filipino people will be given a more difficult time. So he stepped up to this responsibility and uh, led uh, uh, the Philippines through the difficult period of the Second World War. So throughout all of this, you see that these people, the example shown by these people uh, from the 17th century to 1941, was always in the service of the church and the nation. No? Next slide, please. So for the church and the nation, and I think... The metaphor of General Douglas MacArthur in 1945 is very appropriate when he said the University of Santo Tomas is the lighthouse of Christian culture in the Far East. Lighthouse, a tower of light that is a beacon. So I think uh, it's the perfect metaphor for the University of Santo Tomas. Now, uh, for intangible evidence, uh, for intangible, uh, for intangible cultural heritage to be uh, kept alive, there are two things that must be done. First, uh, the intangible heritage must remain relevant to its community. I have no doubt at all that the virtues of prudence, fortitude, and justice remain alive in the UST community. So I think. The relevance is beyond question. Now, the second uh, requirement for intangible heritage to remain alive is for it to be transmitted to the next generation. I hope that this presentation, uh, the timeless legacies in truth and in virtues of the University of Santo Tomas, uh, would be precisely that, that it would be transmitted to you who are present here today because in truth it is not only for Tomasians it is for the Catholic Church it, it is for the Filipino nation and it is for the world 
Next slide, please. These are my sources. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that very interesting presentation. <clears throat> this is one of our best attended webinars, actually. So Thank you very we have, much. <laughs> we have almost around 300 attendees from both Zoom and Facebook Live. So thank you, everyone, for joining us today in our webinar about the University of Santo Tomas. So now we proceed with our question and answer portion. Now, questions are, of course, encouraged. If you are in Zoom, feel free to raise your questions either in the chat button or in the PA button. Or if you're viewing via Facebook Live, feel free to raise your questions in the comment section. And then I will read out the relevant questions for our speaker to respond to. All right. So let me see if there are any questions. So we have from Margot Kamaya from Facebook. Uh, her question is, how did the library survive the 1941 December bombing? I think I mentioned it um, in my uh, presentation uh, that uh, um, the, 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 the administrators, the Dominican fathers, uh, because they already had the UST main building um, operational at that time, it became operational in 1927 when it was opened uh, to accommodate uh, philosophy and letters, I think uh, College of Science, no? um, there was enough space in that new building and the rector and the administrators thought that uh, since they are running out of space, it was becoming too tight in intramuros. The building is not big enough to, um, to accommodate the students uh, the library, you know, which is increasing every year, um, they decided to transfer the library in 19, uh, the, the museum in 1935 and the library a little bit earlier than that. And so it's not only the, the library, but also the museum and the archives, which were all transferred to the main building. And this, uh, since the main building is in San Paolo, it is outside Intramuros. This explains how uh, the, the collection of UST is one of the few uh, that survived uh, the battle for Manila during the Second World War. I hope uh, I answered your question. Thank you so much, Ma. You're now, welcome. earlier you mentioned that one of the finest treasures of Santo Tomas is the Copernicus book. Yes. Which was part, of, actually part of the index of banned books yes. in the Catholic Church. Now, it, yes. if it was banned, why is it that Dominicans had a copy? Um, this, uh, uh, certain parts of the book, if you, uh, are able to take a look at that, no, with special permission, of course, after the, pan the pandemic, no, yes. um, I'm sure Father Aparicio will, uh, will give you, uh, permission, uh, especially if you are from IA, um, uh, you will see that certain parts of the book were blackened out. You know, certain parts were blackened out. It's not the only book that uh, that had that. There are other books, so you can see that there are por there are certain portions of some books that that the uh, that uh, the uh, commissary of the Holy Office thought was was not uh, acceptable, and so this is blackened out. So you, so that explains they don't need to destroy the book itself, but you know to to. Uh, Put uh, to erase, no, to blacken out the the, the 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 words, the sentences, so that nobody would be able to read that. So that I think that partially explains how. And uh, the book itself is thought to be uh, owned by, formerly owned by Hernando de los Rios Coronel, no. So when he um, he passed away, um, it was donated to Santo Tomas. So. Uh, that's also probably another reason because uh, uh, he, uh, Hernando de los Rios Coronel stayed in the Philippines for some time. And um, maybe uh, that's the reason why, um, you know, the Philippines is so far away from Spain um, and from Europe. So there are certain things that may be ordered in Europe but are not always obeyed 
obedece ko, pero no cumplo. As they say, I obey, but I will not comply. Which is very typical of the period. Thank you so much, Paul. Now we have from Richard Tuasan Sanchez Bautista. So, uh, is there a record in the library or in the archives that made mention of how a Dominican architectural design must be executed? As an architect, I noticed that most Dominican buildings or churches has what I call a crowning glory or a tiar, I hope I'm pronouncing this like tiar facade. Should there be any? What could be the reason? And he adds, is there a connection be behind, uh, is there a theology behind the architecture of the Dominicans? I am not an architect architect so i don't know the answer to your question uh and i am not familiar with uh the collection of the archives that would pertain specifically to architecture but i do know that the antonio vivencio del rosario heritage library would have specific volumes that deal with architecture i know that from the catalog i've seen some of them but i've never really looked at them so maybe uh, this is a good uh, opportunity for you, uh, Richard, to probably do research. And uh, this is from Arthur Franz Tenorio uh, from the USD Graduate School. Good afternoon, Dr. De Castro. Good the afternoon. late Dominican uh, historian and saint maker, Reverend Father Dr. Fidel Villero well, wrote a comprehensive two volume book on USD titled The History of University of Santo Tomas. At the end of the book, he said that there should be a third volume, but due to his death, i sorry, health, sorry, health, health. we're still alive by then, <laughs> he, he was not able to finish it. He was wishing that someone would finish writing the book. Does the USD Department of History or someone, or perhaps you, ma'am, um, uh, is there any plans of publishing this third and final volume? Uh, there is no third volume yet. What uh, I think Father Villaroel meant was he wishes he would like others to continue because he, he stopped in the 19, uh, after the war, he stopped uh, in 1945. No? So from 1945 all the way up to the present, this is not uh, uh, included in his two volumes. No, So I think that's what he meant, that uh, the third volume should start where he left off and he is is expressing a wish that others might want to continue that no i don't know any i am not the department chair but you can certainly ask dr resos if the department would have any plans to continue or assign or make this a project to uh, write the 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 remaining portions of the the history of santo tomas as for myself i don't think i can undertake uh uh, this project alone, I would be glad to be part of it, but I don't think it can be done by one person, as I've been explaining to Rancho earlier. You need to know Latin, you need to know Spanish, not just know, but know it very well, not just um, in reading, uh, but also uh, to be able to um, translate certain parts accurately. No? But of course, I'm open to that, but... Uh, Maybe you can direct the question to Dr. Rezos, uh, who would be the chair and would be in the best position to make uh, a decision regarding that. But I would be happy to be part of it. Thank you so much for that, ma'am. Now, uh, for this question, I'm risking for I'm risking a very long answer, but uh, I am <laughs> in any way. So, uh, Rizal was the foremost alumnus of the University of Santo Tomas. Now, very briefly, how would you describe the factual relationship between Rizal and the university, despite the numerous myth myths surrounding such relationship. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad you used the term myths because that's what they are. Because many of these stories about UST and Rizal are not true. For uh, more elaboration, I would uh, direct you to another monograph of Father Fidel Villaroel, which is entitled Jose Rizal and the University of Santo Tomas. And I think you have the copy right there. Thank you very much, Rancho. Uh, so this has been, this book was published in 1984. It's just been reprinted a few years ago. So you can still buy uh, the copy where uh, Father Fidel shows that there is no truth to all the stories that says that Rizal was unhappy at USD. 
no? So this uh this was uh, popularized by textbook writers. I will not mention names. No, you can you can read them and and make uh, the conclusion and make the connection. But uh, uh, one of them is uh, Wenceslao Emilio Retana. I mention his name because that's the beginning. No, but the other textbook writers are Filipino, so I will not mention their names, and I will let you peruse through the different textbooks so you can see that where they picked up this idea from Retana and perpetuated this so that it became uh, like a, a grand narrative of some kind uh, that says that um, Rizal was unhappy at UST. But no, he was not. There is no record that says that Rizal, I am not happy with my grades in UST. Absolutamente. There is nothing like that. That's the most that I will say. And for the rest, uh, in the interest of time, uh, maybe you should uh, get a copy of Father Villaruel Soserizal and the University of Santo Tomas, where he deals with this question minutely, very detailed, with evidence, not just uh, taken uh, or imagined, uh, but based on available evidence or documents. So it's a very scientific work. Thank you so much for that. We have a question from Arthur Tenorio. Now, regarding the foundation of the library, where does it trace its origin? From the Foundation Act of 1611 or from the will of Archbishop Benavides of 1605? From the will, from the will, the last will of uh, Archbishop Benavides, because that's where you see the mention of all his personal uh, uh, library, his books would definitely go to the planned uh, Colegio. Um, uh, of uh, of uh, Santo Tomas, Colegio de Santo Tomas, no? um, or Colegio de Nuestra Señora del Rosario, which is the original name, Colegio de Nuestra Señora del Rosario. By 1623, uh, the records are consistent that the name had been changed to Colegio de Santo Tomas without uh, Nuestra Señora del Rosario anymore. And so this now becomes the basis eventually when the Colegio was elevated in 1645 to the rank of a un universitas or university, um, it would become the University of Santo Tomas. So 1605, the last will of Archbishop Benavides. Thank you so much for that, ma'am. We have a question for Edwin Cabling II, who is a former student of yours. Yes. So he is asking, what are your opinions on the calls for a possible reconstruction of the University of Santo Tomas in Intramuros? Uh, it's good that you said opinion because that's all I can offer. I, um, I, I became aware of that uh, through some posts on Facebook, but I am personally, I really don't think that this would be this would be feasible, number one, because many of the, the actual uh, site where UST is located is now uh, a private property. So um, you have to convince the owners first to sell the property back mm -hmm. and to reconstruct. You have to demolish a very high building, very tall building there, and then to reconstruct uh, the University of Santo Tomas there. So uh, all of this would be uh, conjecture because uh, these are ideas that are being uh, presented. But uh, you're going to have a lot of, I, I see a lot of uh, uh, opposition to that because, because the owners may not see it uh, in the same way that the Tomasians would like to see the revival or the reconstruction of the original um, USD. I think it's you're going to have to go through the eye of the needle in order to be able to do that. Although, I hope I'm wrong, because if that really happens and it pushes through, then I would be one of those who would be rejoicing. Yes. We, our next question is from sorry, Joaquin Carlos de Jesus. Wonderful talk, Dr. De Castro. Thank you. Truly erudite, eloquent, and informative. Are there any practices or traditions from UST that was somehow adopted by other schools or in general the Philippine educational system? Um, I don't know of any specific practice that would be 
um, that would be adopted by other schools. I am, uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not a major of education, no? Maybe the, the, the people who specialize in education would have more knowledge in the history of education, but I don't know of any specific practice that would be uh, adopted by any other school unless uh, some Catholic schools would also, uh, you know, pronounce you a graduate uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and, the, and of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Tomasians, I'm addressing the Tomasians. Remember, during our graduation, uh, what does the first member of the section uh, do? He, he, the, the, the student has to kneel, right? And the formula, this is the formula, would be read by uh, the officiating uh, Dominican uh, friar who would be uh, uh, the guest uh, for that specific uh, commencement or graduation exercises. And he always ends, no, I hereby grant you this degree, etc., 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 in the name of the Father, and he blesses you. Huh? And this is, this is uh, unique to UST also. I don't know whether Catholic schools also do this. I don't know. Uh, I have not studied in any Catholic school except UST, so I don't know. Uh, I'm a public school uh, student from elementary to high school, so I don't know. I, I, I have no personal experience of that. But uh, uh, if other Catholic schools would pronounce their graduates uh, that, that, that this student is, is a graduate in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, maybe that would be one of the things that is um, a, uh, an extension or taken from something like uh, what USD has uh, done. No? Thank you for that. Now, one of, one of the titles of USD is Pontifical, yes. which was granted in 1902. Oh, yes. Now, why is it that USD has been continuously and constantly been using that title even before 1902? In, especially in official documents. Ah, uh, yes. Um, according to uh, Father Villaruel, um, uh, the official title was only given in 1902. Yes, correct. But because it has always upheld uh, Catholic, uh, Catholic beliefs, Catholic dogma, especially St. Thomas Aquinas' teachings, uh, and of course, you all know that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was eventually um, uh, made uh, the patron saint of all universities and the patron saint of all students. So students, you should pray to him during your examinations. Um, so um, it appears in many other different um, documents, but, but all of those are not official. So the only time that uh, UST is, was officially authorized to, to append or to add uh, the term, the, the title Catholic is only in 1902. Before that, it was not official. Uh, our next question is very specific. This is from Arjun Clasara. Thank yes. you, Dr. De Castro, for your presentation. Mom, what are the nature of the cases heard in the Inquisition which are recorded in the Edictus collection of the archives of UST? Were it similar to the idolatry cases of Santo Tomas Batangas in, Pang in Pangasinan during the term of Archbishop Pardo? Thank you very much. Pardo. I have not really looked at the Edictus, no? but uh, I most likely that there would be some issues like that. I, I, I don't really, I cannot really answer the question because I have not really looked into these documents myself, but I thought that I would mention it in order to bring this to the attention of researchers out there who might want to actually do the work because we cannot do all the work by ourselves. This has to be a uh, community effort. This one is from Ferdinand Absalon. Is it true that in 1865, all diplomas issued by other schools were subject for approval by the rector of UST and that examinations leading to the issuance of such diplomas were super supervised by the Dominican professors? If yes, how long did it last? Okay, uh, to, the first, uh, to the first part, is it true that uh, in 1865, all diplomas were issued by 
the University of Santo Tomas. That's, that's what it was. Why is this so? Because in the royal decree of 1865, royal decree meaning Queen Isabella II was the one who uh, authorized UST and assigned it to become the director, actually. The UST director becomes the official inspector of all secondary schools in the Philippines, which makes UST the equivalent of the Department of Education from 1865 to 1898 so starting in 1865 all the way up to the end of the spanish colonial period so even if rizal if dr jose rizal graduated from ateneo municipal we know that but the rector of ateneo municipal has to send copies of his grades every single every school year every time beginning uh, of the school year and at the end of the school year twice a year they are required by law to send this to the rector of the university of santo tomas it has to be received by the rector uh officially accepted by the secretary general and then uh when the time comes for uh graduation the rector of uh, ateneo municipal will petition for the graduation of jose rizal for example and uh, even though uh, Rizal studied at the Ateneo Municipal, if you look at the diploma of Rizal, which is reproduced in the book of Father Villaruel, Jose Rizal, and the University of Santo Tomas, you will see that the heading would say Universidad de Santo Tomas. And then in the text itself of the diploma, Jose Rizal, who studied in Ateneo Municipal, is hereby granted the degree Bachelor in Artes, Bachelor of Arts, which is the equivalent of a high school degree at that time. I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, we're actually, uh, the audience, we're actually running out of time. So thank you so much <laughs> okay. for all your questions. We really appreciate your participation. But before we end the Q&A part, last question, ma'am, uh, just to end the Q&A part of this uh, webinar. Now, uh, for, uh, the graduates of UST, what is your message so that they will not lose touch with their uh, Tomasian heritage? My message for the graduates of UST, well, as I said today, uh, the virtues or the values of fortitude, prudence, justice, these are all uh, everlasting virtues that will never uh, that will stand the test of time for example prudence no doing the right thing at the right time in this time of pandemic what should be the right thing that you should do at the right time wear your mask your face shield wash your hands physically distance so that's that's the thing right and then for fortitude endurance you have to see through this yourself you have to have the endurance to to, not, to have the patience, to have uh, not to break and be affected by stress and to be defeated, to lose hope. Fortitude is precisely that. And it is, it is very relevant for today. And of course, justice. Justice never goes out of style, never becomes irrelevant. No? Uh, the community pantries uh, should be supported. Uh, and there should be no red tagging. So that's my, that's my message for everybody. If you live these virtues, then you are uh, going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you also. And then uh, just to close this webinar, uh, dear audience, we are available in social media. So we are in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And for those who are late, this, in this webinar or for those who forgot to attend or you missed if you ever you missed this episode do not worry because this webinar is going to be uploaded in our youtube channel just go to our youtube uh click key in intramuros administration and don't forget to don't forget to hit the subscribe button and of course i'd also like to promote a google arts and culture page key in intramuros administration as well now ma'am uh do you have any final words for uh, um, well, uh, just that I hope that uh, people would would be uh, more uh, now uh, very conscious of what 
intangible heritage is because intangible heritage are the things that we do not see, we cannot touch, but they are there. These are practices, these are values, these are virtues, which uh, make us who we are, that gives us our distinct identity as Filipinos, as Catholics. So that's part of the message that I wanted to bring across. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you also. And thank you to all of the attendees who participated today in our webinar. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Rancho. Thank you.